So it's been a while since I made my last video, but that's because I have been quite busy with my master's clinical psychology. And of course I have been reading a lot and also I have been interpreting dreams on Instagram. It made me think that I actually want to make my job out of that. And so in the near future I want to create a website on which people can approach me with their dreams or maybe other struggles in life. And yeah, then I will try to, to help them. So I'm excited about that. For now, let's get into the fairy tale of Sleeping Beauty. In this book, The Feminine in Fairy Tales by Marie-Louise von Franz. This is actually the Dutch version. So the English version looks a bit different. But Marie-Louise von Franz, she was a colleague of Jung, of Carol Jung. And she has several books in which she explains fairy tales in, in the Jungian way, let's say, with the, the shadow and the animus and the anima. So that is really interesting. And I totally love that book, so I would recommend it to everyone. But yeah, let's get into Sleeping Beauty. It is interesting because the main theme of Sleeping Beauty is about a woman falling asleep or disappearing somehow. And we can find this theme back in several myths and sagas. For example, in Greek mythology, Persephone, she was abducted by Hades to the underworld. And then the moment when she disappears, then it becomes winter because nature dies. And then when she comes back, when it is spring, then everything blooms again. This is a similar theme, but also we can find that very similar story in the Norse sagas. There's this story about Sigurd and Brunhild, that Brunhild is asleep and Sigurd has to rescue her in the castle. And, well, <laughs> so similar stories. And, and so uh, the story of Sleeping Beauty, it has several versions. And so there are always certain details that differ, but I'm just going uh, to go with the, the version that von Franz uh, explains in her book, and then we'll get into it because it's really interesting. There's a lot to it. Once upon a time, in a faraway land, there were a king and a queen, and they couldn't have a child. The queen was barren. And then one day, the queen was sitting down at the pond, and then suddenly a frog appeared. And the queen told the frog that she really wanted to have a child, but she couldn't. And then the frog, of course, the, it was a talking frog, <laughs> but the frog told her that soon she would have a child. And indeed, nine months later, the queen gave birth to a beautiful baby girl, a, a little princess. They were so happy that they organized a big celebration at the christening of the princess. And they invited 12 wise women, or fairies, if you will. Let's go with fairies. And so at the christening, the fairies, they, they gave their gifts to the princess. Gifts like beauty and kindness and luck and wisdom. And then after the 11th fairy gave her gift, and it was the turn of the 12th fairy, then suddenly 13th fairy appeared. And she was old maybe a little bit ugly even. And she was furious because she was forgotten. She lived somewhere in the forest and nobody thought of her. But she was so furious that she was forgotten, that she was not invited. So she also gave a gift to the princess. And that was the curse that when the princess would be 15 years old, she would sting her finger on a spinning wheel and die. And then the old fairy disappeared. But there was one fairy left who could give a gift to the princess. And all she could do was change the curse a little bit. And instead of dying, the princess would fall asleep for 100 years. But the king didn't want to take any risks, so he burned down all the spinning wheels in the whole land. And then the princess grew up beautiful and wise and kind. And then when she was 15 years old, suddenly she was walking around in a castle and, and she found a tower and she went in there and guess who was there? <laughs> An old lady spinning on a spinning wheel. And so of course the, the princess, she stung her finger and she fell asleep. And with her, the whole kingdom fell asleep. 
everybody and everything. The king, the queen, the baker, the stable boy, the horses, playing children, the dogs, the cats, even the little flies. Everything and everybody fell asleep. And around the kingdom grew a thorn bush. A big, big thorn bush. And during these 100 years, several men and princes, they tried to get through the thorn bush, but they all died. And then eventually, when the 100 years had passed, then there was this prince and he saw the thorn bush and suddenly there were all roses instead of thorns. And the thorn bush or the, the roses, they made way for the prince to pass. And then he found the princess and he kissed her. And she and the whole kingdom woke up finally after 100 years. And well, they got married and they lived happily ever after. There are several details that differ in several versions. So the amount of fairies differs, the, the reason why the last fairy was not invited. One version is about there, was, there were not enough plates. And there's also a version that in the end, the princess didn't just wake up. She first got uh, pregnant from the prince and then she gave birth, still sleeping. Eventually the baby sucked on, on the finger and sucked the, the poison out. Then she woke up. But yeah, so a lot of different versions. It's very interesting. So let's get to the interpretation of this story. So in the beginning, the king and queen are barren and they wish for a child. They wish for creation, for something new. We can see this quite often that first in stories that there is a, a time of nothing, a dark period of time until the hero is born. In this story there is a long period of just dryness. There is nothing and then suddenly the princess gets born. But it's not that suddenly because what it means is that actually we can see this quite often that the creative process is already going on in the unconscious and it heaps up, let's say, and then at one point it all comes out. We can see this with artists that a long time then they have no inspiration and then suddenly they got it. And we can also see this with, for example, psychosis, that before a psychosis, there's nothing really going on, there's no creativity, there's just dryness, and then suddenly someone gets a psychosis. But that's because things are accumulating in the unconscious. This is also the case here. So there is a, a long period of dryness, and then the queen talks to a frog. And what is the frog? The frog comes out of the water, out of the pond. And the water, the pond, is is down water, it's the unconscious, it's chaos, it's the unknown, and the frog comes up. And the frog could mean several things. The frog could symbolize sexual desire, because in spring, then suddenly all the frogs come out, and in spring everything blooms again. It's a desire for creation, so sexual desire. But the frog is also green, and green is the color of Venus, and Venus is the goddess of love. So green is a color of love actually, so it's quite beautiful. So the next thing is the forgotten woman, the forgotten fairy. That is quite an archetypal theme, the forgotten mother goddess. We can also see this theme in the Iliad, where Agamemnon tries to get to Troy, but there is no wind for his boat, and that's because of Artemis the goddess Artemis, she is angry with him because they forgot to make a sacrifice for her. And so she's angry and there is no wind that can bring Agamemnon to Troy, so she needs a sacrifice. These gods, they actually represent parts of our psyche. So for example, Venus is the part of love and sexuality, and Mercury is our intellect, and Mars is aggression and maybe self-defense. And so you need to pay attention to all of them. And you can't just forget about one. Because if you forget about one, then there's no balance anymore. And when there's no balance, then you'll get sick. And that's what Jung said, then you would get a neurosis. 
And so the neurosis is actually a psychological disbalance. So when you forget about the mother goddess, then she'll be very angry and she will take her revenge. We can see this not only on individual level, but also in cultural level. If you look at the Christian tradition, there has a long time been a tradition of honoring Mary. Mary, the mother of God, the mother goddess. This was very positive. But then in the Reformation, they did away with Mary. So actually the Protestants started to ignore the mother goddess. And so that's what we also see since the 60s, I guess, that women, they're trying to be like men. They are working all the time. They're trying to make money and they actually behave more or less like men. And so the mother goddess is being ignored because the mother goddess, she wants to create, she wants to have children. But now women are working and having abortions. That's kind of ignoring mother nature. So she will take her revenge. And maybe that is the reason why we are now in this mass psychosis. So it's quite interesting that if you take a closer look at Christianity, then there are actually three masculine archetypes that are omnipresent in the Christian tradition. So there's God the Father, the wise king, let's say. There is Christ, the son, the hero. And there's the negative masculine archetype, that is Satan, that is the tyrant or the coward. What about the feminine types? There is only Mary, and that's, that's okay, but what about the devouring mother and the heroine? These two types we see back in a lot of fairy tales. So if you look at the Disney movies, for example, there is the devouring mother, the, the negative woman, the evil witch, and the heroine, but not really the loving mother like Mary. Maybe that's because there is so much Mary and loving mother in Christianity, so there needs to be some kind of compensation. But it's interesting if you see that, for example, in Snow White, there's the evil queen and there's the princess, the heroine. Uh, in Cinderella, there is the evil stepmother and the princess, Cinderella. And so this is also the case in Sleeping Beauty. Well, there is a mother, but she is not really that important for the story. And so the, the motive of the girl, the princess, that is being persecuted by the mother goddess is also a well-known theme. We can also see this in the, the Greek myth of Amor and Psyche, where Psyche is being persecuted by her mother-in-law, Venus. And that is because Venus is angry because... Everybody thinks that Psyche is actually more beautiful than her. And so this is very similar to the story of Snow White. The negative feminine is actually everything that is not in balance in the feminine. So she is overly emotional. She can never say no. She has no boundaries. She's like the whore who sleeps with everybody. And she's the person who tries to help everybody at the expense of herself. She is forgiving for everything and everybody. That is quite negative because as a woman, you need to have boundaries. You can't be loving towards everybody. You can't be accepting towards everybody. And you can't be overly emotional because how are you going to survive? So the ignored mother goddess, the ignored woman, she is offended by everything. She is possessed by her animus and that makes her very aggressive and quarrelsome. She wants to argue all the time. She wants to fight all the time. She thinks in terms of power and she's always complaining about everything and she's blaming everything and everybody around her. And so we all know this type of woman that is always offended that you can't say anything anymore because she will feel offended and you will end up fighting with her. We all know this type of woman. It's also the the typical love fight between men and women in the situation that the woman she wants to talk and the men are like oh no i know what that means <laughs> i will never escape this situation <laughs> and it drives men crazy and it will push them away well actually the woman is asking for love and comfort but when a woman is in balance with herself if she is proud of herself if she has self-esteem then this behavior is not necessary, so she won't be animus-possessed. If someone ignores her or 
is rude towards her, she won't feel that offended. Of course, it's, it's not nice, but she won't react in such an extreme way. But some do. And the question is why? Where are the roots of this behavior? Usually that is because of a bad connection with their own mother. Their own mother has been pushing them down, has been denigrating all their lives. And so something is missing there. She misses this, this love, this, this safety. So if you ever feel this way, if you want to fight all the time, if you want to argue all the time, if you feel offended about everything, then try to be in control of those emotions and don't let the emotions control you. Because if you let the emotions control you, then you become possessed by your animus and then this behavior comes out. When a woman is possessed by her animus, she can only view the world in rigid masculine rules and she can't see the nuance in things. And so this is also what we can see in these aggressive feminists who are talking about the patriarchy all the time and who can't see nuance in things, who can see that this world is also a very, very hard place for so many men, they can only view the world in an idea of that men rule the world and women are being oppressed by them. But that's of course not the case. And such women who can't see any nuance, who are stuck in these ideas and only think in terms of power, they're possessed by their animus. So this animus possession is exactly what is the matter with the evil fairy in Sleeping Beauty. And that doesn't mean that the princess did anything wrong to the fairy. Sometimes this is just how it is. This is just what nature does. Sometimes you just can't help things that just happen to you. And so there is this other version of Sleeping Beauty in which the evil fairy is uh, not a woman but an evil wizard and he wants to marry the princess but she rejects him and because of that he creates this curse but she she had to reject him because you can't say yes to everybody as a woman you need to be cruel from time to time but that's not wrong so mother nature can be quite cruel it's interesting because there is this difference in rules about the world from the masculine and the feminine so the masculine is rules made by people and the feminine is actually more like nature it's the laws of nature but also and this is also very interesting that women are able to see the exceptions on the rule of a man for example this is a an example that von Franz mentions in her book that it's a general rule that if your kid asks you to help with his or her homework then you help the kid right but there was a situation in which the kid was playing all day long or doing nothing really important and then at the moment that the mother wanted to do something for herself or she wanted to to go away or something then suddenly the kid needed help with the homework and so the mother said no i'm not going to help you now you had all day long and so this is quite cruel and for the outside world sometimes these decisions of women don't seem very fair but that's because women can see beyond the strict rule and they can see the exceptions and so this can also sometimes be in a benefit of people but these decisions these cruel decisions of women they don't always work out positively for themselves because as we can see with the story of of sleeping beauty then in the version that she rejects the wizard then she's being cursed but she has all the right to reject the wizard Von Franz, she mentions in her book that during World War II, she had some clients in Germany and they didn't agree with the Nazis. And they felt quite horrible by it because they felt that something was wrong with them. Because the whole situation, the, the whole environment was cheering for the Nazis. It felt so wrong to them, but they thought that something was wrong with them. But it's a negative reaction to a negative situation. It's actually very healthy. She also mentions this example that when uh, a little kid responds in a negative way to psychotic matter, that's actually a very healthy reaction. But it's not nice or fun for the kid, but it's actually a very healthy reaction. And so we can also take this in broader perspective, a negative reaction to an unhealthy situation. 
So the last 100 years, it has been pretty crazy in the world. We fell into decadence. We have been partying a lot, doing drugs, abortion, fornication, being in love with money, everything is about money. It's complete decadence and that's not good. So what is the curse that is being put on us then? Well, maybe the situation where we're in right now. Everybody living in fear, everybody kind of crazy, a mass psychosis. That's the curse, that's the price that we have to pay now. So now we arrive at the spinning wheel. The king burned all the spinning wheels, but he forgot about one. And the spinning wheel is also very feminine because it is about making this thread and creating. And you could say it's about creating this lineage because women have children every time. And so we create this whole thread of lineage and that goes on and on and on. But spinning is also related to knitting. It is quite often in these stories that when, when women are knitting a lot, then they're actually creating a cunning plan. And so this is also the case in Charles Dickens' story, The Tale of Two Cities, what is about uh, the French Revolution. And then there is this, this woman who is always knitting and she's, she's making plans and she is quite, well, like a mean woman. And eventually she was one of the first people who chopped off the heads of the aristocrats. Well, not literally like this, but she was like very enthusiastic about the revolution and chopping off heads. And then when the revolution happens and when there was the guillotine and everybody got decapitated, then there was always this line of women who were sitting in the front to see the beheadings. They were knitting. Women that are knitting are creating plants and are creating a web that you can get trapped in. And so this is also the idea about the spinning wheel. And then the needle on the spinning wheel, that is also something interesting because when you are fighting with women, they never hit you, they never slam the doors. But what women do is kind of poison you with their words. They sting you with their tongue. So that's what the needle is. It is poisonous and, and women can poison your mind with their words. They're very good at it. We don't hit very hard, but... And so, as I said before, sometimes um, the main problem of a woman is her mother. The mother was maybe very denigrating. The mother could have been poisoning her child with her words. What that does to some women or some men is that they become quite passive because they have such low self-esteem. They become passive. They can't do anything anymore and they fall asleep. It's also the case that when women are not being touched by intellectual or religious ideas that are actually masculine, then her soul falls asleep and thus her masculine part is not there. So her animus is not there at all and she becomes very passive. So the case with the evil fairy is that she's possessed by the animus and with her curse and her poison she takes away the animus of the princess in its totality. And so the princess becomes very passive. But also, at the same time, as we discussed, when women are possessed by their animus, it could be because of their mother, it could be because of low self-esteem, they become very aggressive, very quarrelsome. And so this is actually then the case with the thorn bush. So the princess, so she is kind of possessed by her animus and the animus is not there at the same time. That is quite interesting in the story, but the, the thorn bush is, again, when a woman is always offended, you can't get through to her and she will kill you actually if you try to, because all these men that try to go through the thorn bush, they all died. That is the case with women that are offended by everything. It's also a power complex, this thorn bush. It's a power complex. And eventually what the story tells is that sometimes you just have to wait. Sometimes you just have to wait just 100 years and then it will solve itself. And that is where then eventually after 100 years the prince came and there were suddenly roses. And then just like that the problem was solved. It just needed time. And so these women that have this power complex that are possessed by their animus also just sometimes need time. So that was the story of Sleeping Beauty. Of course, I could talk much more about it, but I think this uh, will suffice for now. And in the near future, I want to do more videos like this with interpretation of fairy tales and things like that. 
So I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you learned something and maybe you have your own interpretations or your own ideas. So let them know in the comments and I'll see you at the next one.